far away in another life. I walked my land proud and free, far away from my other life, searching Far away in those distant lands, life's hard, but living is good. There, the hunt leaves no blood on my hands. There I Where the sun warms the deepest folds And the rain sleeps on rocks so old And the night falls and stories told I'd like to be But they don't know the pain in me Cause they can't know what I can see I'm surrounded by misery 
I'd like to be always free far away home far away in another name I walked my soul proud and free Now I'm torn from that distant land I'm going home Good morning everybody It is almost midday on the 9th of March 2021 you're listening to podcast number 46 and its title runs something like Alter Diagrams Part 3 Philosophers 4 equals 7 now I want to begin here by making an apology for taking so long to get this podcast out. I think I'm two or three months overdue now, and there are a number of reasons for that. Um, and one of those reasons I will be making an announcement about at the end of this video. So if you're interested in that, skip to the end or watch right through until I talk about it. And the other main reason for being so late is it's summer in the southern hemisphere at the moment and summer is the busiest time for me as I work as a chef and um, there are all kinds of changes happening at my job where management is concerned at the moment and so summer has just been hectic but I think this is the fifth take of podcast 46 a few technical problems that had to be ironed out but hopefully today everything is good and for a change um, I'm indoors instead of outdoors so the name of the altar diagram that I will be discussing in this podcast is the Garden of Eden after the fall and we first need to understand when we're looking at this diagram that the Garden of Eden after the fall diagram is the sister diagram to the one we discussed previously in the in the last podcast the Garden of Eden before the fall. These two diagrams go together because uh, when we look at them in context they both help explain each other. And so first of all we need to do a quick recap on the, the details of that last diagram. If you didn't watch that previous podcast number 45 I suggest you go back and look at it first otherwise you might find it a little bit difficult to understand what we're talking about here because I'm going to talk about this diagram for this podcast more briefly than in the previous all the heavy detail is in the previous podcast so the previous diagram presented to us a schematic drawing in hermetic symbolism of the state of the human psyche before it entered into corruption in other words in its perfected condition in its perfect blueprint condition what the human mind is before anything gets knocked out of kilter in it and then alternatively the diagram that we're looking at here 
the Garden of Eden after the fall shows us what the human psyche looks like after the soul has been caught up in the cycle of reincarnation. And that requires a little bit of explaining before we go any further. The concept of the fall is of course a biblical concept which anybody who is familiar with the Old Testament will be aware of. The garden, the, the, the concept of the, the fall refers to God banishing Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden which basically is represented by the previous altar diagram the perfected mind and God then uh, expelled them into the earth or into physical reality or into what I call binary reality and what this does is because of the conditions that exist in binary reality and the way that environment impacts on a, an incarnate soul's life, physical life, uh, the um, effects of physical existence start to corrupt the psyche. And then after hundreds or thousands or millions of incarnations into binary reality, the human soul or the human psyche, they both mean the same thing, uh, ends up in the condition that we see described in the present diagram. Now the previous diagram showed us the mind in a state of balance and this diagram shows us the mind when it's whacked out of balance and the first thing that we can recognize which shows us that is that in the previous diagram the nefesh who is the female down near the bottom of the diagram is standing in that previous Garden of Eden schematic diagram with her hands upraised holding on to the bases of two pillars and every Kabbalist knows that these two pillars represent the balance between severity and mercy or evil and good if you want to put it that way then when we look at the present diagram, Eden after the fall, we notice those pillars are gone. And that Nefesh, instead of looking up with her arms raised up holding those pillars, she has fallen down. And her body is now immersed in the underworld or the realm of the Klipoth, which is governed by the part Sufi that Kabbalists refer to as Nakash, the serpent, or as Hermetus referred to as the red dragon. So she's now fallen down, she's looking down, she's reaching down, and she's immersed in that realm, which means that everything that the Nefesh stands for, her structure and her functions and her role in the human mind, is now deeply immersed in the realm of corruption, the clip-off or the shells. And if we look up at the gentleman above her, who represents symbolically the Ruach, or the thinking mind, the same thing has happened to him. Because balance has been undermined, he has fallen also, and he's now instead of having his arms raised and his head raised, he's looking down, his arms are stretching down and he has sunken deep into the realm of the unconscious mind which is represented by Nefesh. So imbalance has flooded the psyche and the first primary part of the symbolism of this diagram that should attract our attention is that 
In the previous diagram we noticed that the red dragon is coiled up in a kind of a circle and he sits down below Malkut or the physical world with his heads tucked into that ball but in this diagram he is awoken and his heads now reach up into the seven lower sephiroth of the tree of life those which exist below the abyss what this means is that as a consequence of becoming enmeshed in corruption Nakash has awakened and his force what he is, what he stands for, his structure and his function have now infected all of the functions of the temporal or lower personality. In other words, that part of you which is incarnate, and that means everything below the abyss, which involves seven of the Sephiroth, is now polluted by the effect of Nakash. So this is the first main aspect of the diagram that we need to uh, focus on and be aware of the meaning of. That we know <coughs> that primarily this altar diagram <coughs> represents the corruption of the mind because Nakash is polluting two-thirds of the mind's content, that which is in temporal existence. This condition represents the state of mind of every single normal person alive on earth, and by normal person I mean non-initiate, because initiates, people who are involved in authentic training and uh, initiate initiation training in any tradition which provides authentic initiation training <clears throat> they're outside of the bounds of this diagram that we're looking at here because that initiatory training has already started repairing the corrupt condition of their mind so this diagram that we're looking at now represents the mind of the common or uninitiated individual and it represents everybody but I need to uh, provide a caveat there and say that the degree of corruption and the intensity of corruption that exists in any single individual's mind as a consequence of the nak Nakash polluting the lower mind varies from person to person. Some people are more corrupt some people are less corrupt. Some people are corrupt in certain directions and other people are corrupt in other directions. So this diagram does not simply say every human being is extremely corrupt and in the same kind of a way. That's not what it's saying at all. What it's saying is we are all corrupt but to different degrees and in different ways. If this was not true, then we wouldn't need initiation. That is a method of rescuing us from corruption and bringing us back to a state of perfection, since that is what initiation in the West, anyway, provides. The second part of this diagram, which we need to be aware of, the second major facet of this diagram and its symbolism, we can see reflected in the upper part of the diagram, where we can see a large circle, and it has a male and female head in it, and above those two heads there's a crown. And every Kabbalist will know that this male and female and the crown represent what we call the supernal Sephiroth or the three highest functioning spheres. They exist above the abyss on the tree of life and therefore they are beyond corruption. 
they exist in a realm of perfection and the standard Kabbalistic term for that is that they exist in the archetypal world and an archetype is like a blueprint or a pattern in a perfect state but we notice when we look at these three supernal sephiroth that the woman on the left hand side of that large circle has her head turned away from us and what that tells us how we translate that symbol is that she has turned away from or turned her back on the lower functions of the mind or the incarnate personality and this happens as a consequence of the rising of the Nakash and the pollution of the lower mind. When Nakash takes over the lower mind, the bridge or link or connection between the lower functions and the higher functions is broken. And that is what is represented by the Nashama or that female figure turning away from the person who is viewing the diagram or turning away from the temporal or lower aspects of the human personality. And this condition is the condition that exists in your average human being. Your average human being goes about their life only really ever being aware of their Ruach, which is their thinking mind, and the conscious awake part of themselves that views and makes judgments and plans about the world and Nefesh. She represents the part of the mind which is the emotions and the non-rational part of the mind. The average person is only aware of these two things and of course of Nakash. We are all aware of our base instincts, our bad behaviour and our corrupt attitudes about things which are all personified by the Nakash and the Klipoth. The average person only being aware of these parts of themselves and almost never aware of the higher functions. In an illuminated individual, their higher functions are just as much a part of the presence of their mind as the Ruach and the Fesh are, the thinking and the emotions and the Nakash, the dark side of ourselves. But in the common person, since the higher functions are cut off from the lower functions, the common person, the average person, the non-initiate, almost never becomes aware of the functioning of those higher parts of the self in the mind. They almost never hear the voice. They almost never feel the effect of those higher functions. But I say almost because there are circumstances in the average person's life, not everybody, but a lot of people, where certain things happen to them and they suddenly, for a short period of time, become aware of those higher functioning parts of the mind. But the important thing is to understand that the reason why Nashama has her head turned away is because of the link or the connection or the conscious awareness of that upper part of the mind has now been severed and no longer exists. And it is the task of authentic initiation to build that bridge again between the lower self and the higher functions. So behind Nishama is the care or that Patsufaya which represents complete wisdom and he is behind her. She's turned away, he's behind her so his effect is blocked from us as well and of course the crown or the Kida is completely out of our reach beyond Nishama and Kia and their effect. So this is the second important part of this diagram that we need to understand. That in the average person the higher functions are separated 
from the lower functions and there is no longer a conscious awareness of the mechanisms of the higher functions. Now the third important aspect of the symbolism of this diagram we can see roughly around the middle of the tree of life and that's those four figureheads there the man, the eagle, the bull and the lion and in hermetic and tarot symbolism they are known as the cherubim of the four elements or, the, or what we would call the intelligences or the minds or the psyches of the four elements and this is further emphasized by the Hebrew letters above their heads Yod He Vol He which spell out the name Yehovah which is the of course the supreme deity of the Old Testament and the letters of Yehovah represent the four elements also this is further emphasized by the cross which is kind of in the background of the diagram the four-armed cross which is made up of the colors of the four alchemical elements and these four arms of the cross symbolically refer to another Old Testament doctrine about the four rivers which flowed out of Eden. So each one of these arms, elemental arms of the cross, represents one of those four rivers. So the four faces of the cherubim and the four rivers of Eden together represent the four elements extending out of Eden or the archetypal world. And anybody who is familiar with alchemical symbolism and alchemical doctrine, and particularly the alchemical doctrine of creation, will know that alchemy teaches us that the physical world originally was compacted into chaos as a seed, and that God caused something to happen in that chaos which caused it to expand and divide and then the four elements extended out of that original chaos. What this refers to is how physical reality was created in hermetic terms. Everything in physical reality Hermetism teaches us is composed of four elements and so on our diagram the altar diagram that we are considering right now everything below the supernals represents the four elements extending out of the original pure garden into physical reality the four cherubim and the four rivers are symbolic metaphors for the building blocks of physical reality. Now we should be aware that this diagram and the previous one are based of course on the story of the Garden of Eden from Genesis in the Old Testament. And a part of that story tells us that when Adam and Eve misbehaved and ate the fruits of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that means the fruits of physical existence, God got angry and expelled them from the Garden of Eden. And when he did this, the Old Testament tells us he placed cherubim at the gateway into the garden and a sword, a flaming sword, which turned every which way to guard the way through that gateway. And we've got to remember these stories are not to be taken literally. They are metaphors and they are described 
in traditional symbolic language. The gateway into Eden represents the way back for a soul into the perfected state that is represented by the previous diagram, the previous altar diagram. And when Adam and Eve were booted out of Eden, God did something which made it impossible for them to get back into that perfect state without meeting certain conditions. So the first thing about blocking that gateway or guarding that gateway is the four elements. The soul has to learn about, live in and manage the condition of the four elements, the building blocks of physical reality, before they can be ready to get back through the gateway into the perfect Eden. And that refers to the fact that we are in physical reality for a purpose. And that purpose is also stated in the Old Testament, to learn about the mechanics of binary reality, to learn about good and evil, as the Old Testament puts it. Puts it. And, and learning about the mechanics of good and evil, the mechanics of binary reality, is directly related to the four elements, since the four elements are a manifestation of binary mechanics. The second important part of the gateway back into the perfected, perfected Eden is the flaming sword which turned every which way in order to bar the entrance back into the perfected Eden. And that flaming sword we can see represented in this diagram by a sword that has a zigzag kind of a shape above the cherubim. And that sword is kind of laying on the diagram where the abyss would normally be on the Kabbalistic Tree of Life. This sword represents initiation and its shape and its symbolism and its metaphorical meaning take us back to the first of the altar diagrams and we can see in the first altar diagram that there's a zigzagging sword reaching from Keta at the top of the tree to Malkut at the bottom of the tree and the edges of the blade of that sword are flaming and this sword represents the pathway of initiation moving up the tree in a zigzagging pattern and in reverse 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 to get back to Keta at the top of the tree. In hermetic symbolic cipher language we refer to that flaming sword as the lightning path because once we start on that path once we earnestly begin on that path the journey back to the perfected Eden is fast the lightning path so that little zigzagging sword in the diagram that we're looking at now represents the process of authentic initiation. It represents all the ideas that are encompassed in the first altar diagram. And what it tells us is that we can't open the doorway back into the original Eden without going through the process of initiation. Initiation is like a sword that guards the gateway. In other words, until we master that sword, until we master the process of initiation, there is no entering in back into Eden. So this is the third important 
facet of the Garden of Eden after the fall diagram and that is the while the mind is corrupted and the higher functions are cut off from the lower functions the only way to repair that situation involves two things and those two things are that we have to complete our education here knowledge of good and evil and then we have to enter upon the lightning path the path of initiation and we can't successfully do that until we've completed the first purpose the first task which is our education in knowledge of good and evil God did not say I'm throwing Adam and Eve out of the garden and binding them to the earth in order that they learn the wisdom of the mechanism of binary reality just to then allow people to go oh, I've had enough of this I'm going to look for the ticket out of here you have to complete the education first before you become qualified to start upon the path of initiation because the path of initiation when worked properly and fully to its logical conclusion disconnects the soul from the necessity for reincarnation so there's not a lot of complex information in this diagram to completely understand it it's a good idea as I said to go back to the previous diagram and look at all the bits and pieces that I describe in detail then take that and listen to what I've said here the Nakash which represents the dark side of ourselves in our mind has poisoned the entire lower part of the tree in other words the functions of Nefesh the emotional side of ourselves the subjective side of ourselves the non-rational side and the Ruach the thinking rational side of ourself both of those things make up the seven lower spheres on the tree and they are all corrupted by Nakash go back to the podcast I made which discusses in detail the nature of Nakash and there you'll learn that Nakash is the repository in our unconscious mind where all of our bad experiences go and where all of our confusion all our unanswered questions all of the memories of traumas in our life all get stored inside of Nakash and the sum total of all of those things in that basket make up what Nakash is conflict corruption dishonesty lying bad behavior being a con man and more than anything else all of these things compiled together create anxiety paranoia and fear all of those things have their source in Nakash and Nakash infects Nefesh and Ruach to some degree in everybody's life that's what this diagram is relating to us the second important concept is that because of this corruption the higher functions are severed from the lower functions this does not mean that the higher functions no longer govern and create the reality of the entire lower self because they do they never cease running the show but being cut off from the lower functions means that the lower functions are unaware of the higher functions and what develops out of this situation is atheism agnosticism a total distrust and disbelief in religion and spirituality and a kind of lingering desperation because of that 
all that is divine in us is in those three upper sephiroth. When we are cut off from them, we don't have conscious experience and knowledge of the beneficial effects of those part of ourselves. So while they still govern the lower reality, the lower reality itself is completely unaware of their existence and the fact that they create and rule all of our physical world and all of our life. Everything that we come across, everything that we think and feel, everything that we achieve and lose is all governed by our higher functions. But because we're cut off from that, we believe that we are the ones responsible. And in particular, the Ruach himself thinks he's the one who's ruling the individual self. This is why the, the old Kabbalists called the Ruach and Nefesh the king and the queen. Because they think they rule the country, the territory, the personality of the individual person because they're unaware of the divine. They think they're the ones doing the ruling. Again, the third part of this diagram, which is important, is the knowledge surrounding the uh, region just below the abyss, the gateway into and out of the original perfect Eden. That that gateway is guarded by two things, the need to complete our education in knowledge of good and evil and then the need to complete a successful journey on the lightning path of initiation. Those two things are required in order to get back into the Garden of Eden. So that is the full summation of the primary symbolism of this altar diagram. When a new aspirant seeking initiation comes to a teacher, an authentic teacher, an authentic initiator, if that initiator is working in the West and is a learned Kabbalist, he knows that that aspirant is in the condition that is shown by this altar diagram. Eden after the fall and he also knows that his job as the initiator is to repair that situation to remove the heads of the dragon from the lower Sephiroth and to evolve through initiation the initiate back to the gateway to the garden and then into the garden and then onwards into a state of illumination. What the initiator often doesn't know <coughs> is exactly what this corrupted state, how it manifests in the individual student. How corrupt are they? How undeveloped or immature spiritually is that student? What kind of a nature does that corruption manifest in in that particular student? And part of the initiator's job in the early parts of initiatory training is to assess just how corrupt the student is, how spiritually mature or immature that student is, and whether or not they've completed the journey of education and knowledge of good and evil and actually are ready for the process of initiation. Because if they're not ready, the dragon still has full hold on the lower personality and will not let go, no matter how good the teacher is. All the initiator can do is facilitate a natural condition that the student should already have reached, which is to attain that point where their education in good and evil is complete or almost complete, can be completed in a lifetime or a couple of lifetimes. 
So I think that is really enough said about this diagram. Again, this podcast and the one previous to it, listen to together. And if you look at both those uh, altar diagrams together and consider and contrast and compare them, uh, a full understanding about what they're trying to tell us will come forward. And this is why these diagrams are so important in the golden dawn ceremonial initiation process. And also why the golden dawn has been up until this point largely a failure. Because very few people understand these diagrams. Out of all the dozens and dozens of books that been, have been written in the last hundred years about the Golden Dawn system, I can't think of one which explains the nature of these diagrams. And the nature of these diagrams is to explain to us the underlying plan of the process of initiation. If you don't understand that plan, if you look at those diagrams and can't recognize that this is what they are saying, hey, this is what people should be doing and what they should be achieving and the conditions of things on the journey of initiation. If you can't recognize that that's what's in those diagrams, you're never going to be in a position to actually deliver initiation effectively because it can't happen accidentally. It has to be deliberate and conscious on the part of the teacher and the student. So philosophers, four equals seven, that this diagram belongs to, is the last of the ceremonial initiation degrees in the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. After four equals seven comes a degree called the portal degree, which is kind of like a doorway between the outer order of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn and the inner order, which is called the Red Rose and the Cross of Gold. It's a pseudo-Rosicrucian order. And the titles for that order all have to do with adeptship. So after four equals seven, the next ceremony that you are then allowed to take when the people running the temple are, feel that you are ready for that level of training is the portal degree. And the portal degree also has an altar diagram and we can see it here it's referred to its title is something I'll, I'll put a picture of it here its title is something along the lines of the hieroglyphic meaning of uh, the god Jupiter or Pan now it's not hard to recognize that this picture, which is used as the altar diagram for the portal degree, it, it, it doesn't gel with the previous three altar diagrams that we looked at. It's obviously not in the same category. It doesn't have the same feel or look or theme. And I think it's reasonable to guess that when the guys who created the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn filled out all the bits of the rituals from the bare bones of the degree plan that they were given, that they inserted this picture, this pan diagram into the portal degree themselves in order to elaborate in some detail upon something which is important where the portal concept itself is concerned. Now it's a long time since I've read and mucked around in the Golden Dawn system and with their degree system and I can't exactly remember but I think that that diagram has been largely removed from the portal degree now and that uh, the 
charges or speeches connected with that altar diagram no longer exist. Uh, I certainly have never heard any Golden Dawn people who are part of the mainstream culture of Golden Dawn activity mention or discuss this Jupiter Pan diagram or the fact that it is the altar diagram for the portal degree. So because I don't believe that it's part of the original system, I'm not going to discuss it here in these podcasts. So what we're going to do is, in the next podcast, we are going to move on to the next altar diagram in the first degree of the inner order, which is Adeptus Minor 5 equals 6. And that altar diagram is found inside what is called the Vault of the Adepts. The subject matter of the Vault of the Adepts is complicated, and so it's very likely that the next podcast will be long and complicated in order to describe what the Vault is and where it came from, or I'm going to break that podcast in two and talk about the Vault in the first podcast and then the altered diagram itself in the second. I'm not quite sure yet, but I think it's probably likely that I'm going to break that subject of the 5 equals 6 altered diagram into two different podcasts in order to keep them inside of an hour in length each. So that is, with any luck, what is coming up next in podcast number 47 Adeptus Minor 5 equals 6 now before I go I've got a couple of announcements to make the first one is that some of you will be aware that I run an email forum and that I have for about the past 6 years and any of you who are on that email forum are probably aware that uh, our, that that email forum basically was uh, grounded in a, a bunch of essays that I delivered and discussed with people on the forum. 152 essays amounting to close to half a million words altogether or something. Um, and that these podcasts actually grew out of those essays. These podcasts are actually the latest upgrade on those essays. Nevertheless, that, that email forum still runs today, and I often have put links in the description below uh, to that forum, but there is a problem with that. And that is that the forum used to exist at Yahoo Groups, and Yahoo closed down that service after 20 years. Uh, in December, I think it was, just gone. December, just gone. Um, so when they closed that down, we shifted to a new service called groups.io. And basically, groups.io is virtually the same thing as Yahoo Groups was. So please, if you're trying to get involved in the email forum, be aware that there's a new address for it now. It's no longer Yahoo Groups, it is now groups.io and the address for that will be down in the description below this video. The second announcement is, and this is one of the things that has taken up all my attention over summer, some of you will also be aware that I have been running a school that teaches classic Hermetism and I've been running that school for almost 35 years now but we never used to accept entry-level students. The teaching in that school which is known as the Herodom Group uh, starts off at quite a complicated level and if you haven't had a good background in studying the general Western Hermetic environment, education environment, if you aren't familiar with Kabbalah and the basics of laboratory alchemy, 
then it's very hard to get involved with uh, the training and study process that we have been delivering up until this point in time. But be largely because of the email forum, there has been a demand expressed for us to provide an entry level education into our advanced training. And so over the last few years we've been in the process of seeing if we can make that happen and that project is known as Herodom College. And some of you are subscribed to the newsletter for Herodom College where we update everybody on what's happening there and you will know that we are edging our way relatively quickly towards beta testing Herodom College's entry level education program and so the announcement I want to make today is that we are right on the verge now of kicking off that beta test. We have the whole online education facility set up. All the IT has been pretty much ironed out now. We have the tutor college for Herodom College uh, peopled with a number of tutors to govern the first intake of students and we are a good way into editing and proofreading and professionally formatting the instruction. So because enough instruction has been done already, prepared already, we are about ready to bring the first group of students in to beta test the system. And I will be announcing when we are ready to do that very shortly. And uh, I would like to take applications from people who watch these podcasts and who are on the forum and people who are already uh, involved in training with the Herodom group in some way to take part in that beta test group but not yet please do not contact me yet asking for a position in that beta test team I will announce when we're ready to do that so anybody who emails me early will be immediately eliminated from uh, us picking a beta test group. There are some privileges that will go along with anyone who becomes part of the beta test team and some of those privileges involve things like you'll become a founding member and you'll get uh, special access to individual one-on-one -on -one tutoring and to webinars and to some special uh, documentation and texts that we have been preparing over the last few years. Very important laboratory alchemy texts which pretty much don't exist anywhere else in the English language but are foundational to the Western Hermetic tradition. So there is a benefit to, there's a payoff for applying to become a beta tester for the Herodom College. So please keep your ears open for that if you're interested. Another newsletter will be coming out to just reiterate what I've just said. And the important point is that that beta test should be taking place before the middle of this year. So thanks again for watching. Thank you very much if you stayed through the whole video to this point. And I hope to see you in the next podcast, number 47, which will be on the altar diagram for the vault of the adepts in the 5 equals 6 grade Adeptus Minor of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. Far away in another life I walked my land proud and free Far away from my other life Searching I Far away home.
far away in those distant lands. Life's hard, but living is good. There the hunt leaves no blood on my hands There I would roam My far away home Where the sun warms the deepest fold And the rain sleeps on rocks so And the night falls and stories told I'd like to be wonder. 